Hello, everyone. Hey, hello. Listen. So, hello to this event um, that is a global event uh, in order to introduce our eighth advanced architecture contest. So, we are very happy to say hello to many of our friends that are distributed all uh, over the globe. Maybe uh, Florencia is in Los Angeles, is still sleeping, it's 6 a.m. there. Ah, Flo is there, so she's already there. And Don Bates is in Melbourne, I think it's 11 p.m. So I think that we are covering all over the globe. We have Mu that is there, he is from Shenzhen. We have uh, Melat uh, and Anapuma. Anupama is also here, Anupama Kundo, she is uh, from India, but she is today in Berlin. And I suppose that other uh, speakers will be connecting later. Um, as you know, uh, IAC uh, started in the year 2005. And this was an idea from Lucas Capelli, that today is a member of the board of IAC, uh, to organize an online debate uh, now that internet was growing, I think that Instagram didn't exist in that moment. I think that, I don't know if Facebook already existed. So it was uh, really the early moments of the digital world. But Lucas say, why, why we don't organize a global contest where we ask uh, people all over the world about uh, <clears throat> what is the future of architecture? And then the award will be to come to study to IAC. This will be good for people around the world because maybe they will allow, uh, will be able to come to study with us. And for us will be also great because we'll be attracting talented people. And then other people will have their drawings exposed in a publication that we are doing with ACTAR. And the truth is that we did this uh, like right now, 16 years ago. Ago, and this was a really a big success. And since that moment, with the collaboration of many other people, including Areti, that is here, Tomas, and Willy, and many others uh, that are also co directors of IAC, uh, we have been organizing this competition. So this year, we, we decided that we should approach the, uh, a topic that uh, we, we were discussing about buildings. We are talking in other editions about the productive housing, uh, the, pro the productive city, the self-sufficient city, the sensible city, the self up house. So we had several topics, but we never, we never were discussing exactly about the closest uh, skin to our habitat that is more our home, but mainly is even our body. So that's why this year the topic is design for living, trying to use the word living on the idea of the living because we are protecting our life. We are living in a living room and we are defining the way we live. And then uh, the subtitle is Global Context from uh, to rethink our habitat from the body to the city, because in fact, our, in our competition, we let the people almost say whatever they want, if they are somehow answering to the topic, but we let them choose also the scale. Maybe someone will be proposing some element to protect the body, some small house, some building, even some topics connected with the cities. And, uh, and that's why the, this body, uh, rethinking our habitat from our body to the city is the general topic. Uh, we have with us also Areti Marco Pulu, that is the uh, head of education at IAC and co-director of the master. Hello, Areti. And we have also with us Xavier Marcet. Xavier is the president of the board of IAC. Uh, Xavier is not an architect, he's expert in innovation. And uh, maybe Xavier, you want to share with us some, something before we start to talk with our guest people. Hey, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be, to be here to see as a, a global gathering. Uh, in that moment, uh, in every place, uh, we're uh, feeling 
uh, in a new world cities, livings. And for that, uh, we think we need to reimagine the city and reimagine housing. And for that, we are here. Huh? Thanks, uh, Vicente, and thanks, everybody. Good. So I think that we are going directly to go to Melbourne. Uh, we have uh, Donald Bates. Don is a, an old friend. Uh, he is one of the best architects in, at least in Australia. Uh, he ran his office, the Lab Architecture Studio. He did many incredible projects uh, there and also in other places around the world, including China. And today is the chair of the uh, School of Architecture and Design uh, in the University of Melbourne. He's teaching in one incredible building designed by Nader Terani. I was lucky to visit some years ago. And what we would like to ask to uh, Don is that maybe he can explain us how, uh, how has been his experience about this lockdown process and how, and the topic today will be to discuss how he imagined, uh, how each of the guest people invite the, imagine the future of, uh, of the place where we live. So Don, uh, good evening from Melbourne. Hi, how are you? Great. Yeah, uh, well, let me just say a little bit about the situation that occurred here in Melbourne. So uh, the academic year in Australia effectively starts at the end of uh, February, the beginning of March. So the uh, sort of spread of the pandemic really started to hit just before the semester started. And uh, we particularly in our graduate program, we have a lot of uh, international students, quite a few who come from China, but also from India, the Middle East, uh, and other places, some from South America. And so as the semester was just about to start, uh, became some of the restrictions on travel, particularly travel from China into Australia. And Australia was one of the first countries that imposed a restriction on Chinese citizens uh, coming into Australia, that they could only come as long as they spent two weeks someplace else in advance. Uh, so that had a big impact on us trying to know how many students were gonna be coming for the semester, uh, whether they would be able to come or not. Uh, and so that planning was very much in flux. Uh, then. Once the semester started, within about two weeks of the semester, then students were no longer allowed to be on campus. And then about a week later, uh, everybody had to leave campus. So we began teaching everything online in a very, very short period of time. Uh, so there were been a few weeks of trying to get things organized, but we just completed last week our mid-semester reviews. So we're about halfway through. We'll finish in the latter part of June. So we're now moving into the sort of uh, dealing with what we have to deal with uh, in terms of teaching and completing the semester. Um, as you may know, Australia has actually been very fortunate in terms of infection rates and certainly in terms of deaths. Uh, it's still less than 100 people that have died uh, from the COVID-19 virus in Australia. It's a little over 6,500 who have been infected uh, but the infection rates now for the whole of the country are less than less than 20. Some days they're less than 10. So there's now quite a bit of talk of relaxing some of the restrictions within the next two or three weeks. And there are proposals from the federal government to be back at university campuses by the end of July. Um, so that's sort of where we sit in terms of the context. Um, I think to answer the question about you know, what impact or what influences uh, this might have, particularly on forms of living, uh, Melbourne itself is uh, certainly the downtown, the central business district, the CBD, has in the last 15 years constructed a significant number of high rise apartment buildings. And the vast majority of these are uh, accommodating students. Um, 
they're speculative. Most of them are speculative developments. Uh, various uh, investors purchase the apartments and then rent them out to international students that are here. And increasingly, as part of the, that development, the apartments have gotten smaller and smaller uh, from a cost plan, uh, cost point of view, but also just in terms of the market has been very good. So you were able to sell smaller and smaller apartments. And part of that operated under a notion that, well, it's actually the city that is the living room. When you have a dense, fairly dense urban central quarter, as opposed to a suburban condition, that one can actually live out of the city, that the dinner, uh, play, research, everything happens outside. So in fact, an apartment becomes nothing more than a place to sleep at night. With the uh, restrictions now imposed, the stay at home restrictions, this really changes the way we think about uh, the apartments. You know, is it possible to really live fully in 20 square meters or less? Um, I'm not very optimistic that once this is all over, anybody's gonna suddenly make uh, larger apartments. I think the apartment sizes will sort of stay the same, but it certainly changes that relationship to imagining that the urban domain is the living space of, of a habitation and that uh, your apartment is really nothing more than a place to store your clothes and to sleep at night. Uh, so it's one of the things that I'll be interested to see the conversations that go forward. There have been some conversations about the return of the suburban uh, because it's, we're more separated, so therefore we're safer. I don't believe that's going to, to happen. I think cities will continue to move towards density. Uh, but I do. the other part that I am really interested in is whether the consequence of this is less the sort of formal uh, design component, but actually a return to expertise and to believing in evidence and experts as providing a way forward. Yeah, I, I mean, following your, uh, your argument, uh, I must say that I was lucky because you, was, uh, walking, uh, you were walking to me in the center of Melbourne for two or three hours as uh, may you know, Melbourne uh, has, has been in the last years the best city in the world from the livable point of view in many, in many of these rankings of cities. And then the concept that you say is that Melbourne makes the effort to transform the downtown in a kind of living room with incredible sidewalks, with a lot of trams, with very few cars, with a lot of coffees. But then with this pandemic, this change because obviously the apartment were small, the people were using the city as a living room, but then mm -hmm. uh, suddenly the, 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 that living room didn't exist anymore. So, yeah, exactly. uh, well, that's super interesting because that means that uh, I would say that in Melbourne is very difficult to recognize the idea of the block or the community that maybe in China will see mm -hmm. that this is really working. Um, but Melbourne is not only the downtown, Melbourne also has a beach and has a kind of broader uh, suburbial area. So mm. in, uh, in, but also Melbourne and Sydney are, uh, are growing very fast. I mean, they are very dynamic mm. on attracting people. So is mm. there any debate or any difference about people living in the downtown, in the towers, and then the people living in these suburbial houses that in fact, they are very close to the center of the city. Uh, I suppose that the people living with some green area had a better opportunities to, to, have, uh, to have access to the sun at least, no? Well, look, I mean, the, the Melbourne's still very fortunate that even close to the downtown, there are actually a lot of very large parks and river walkways and such. And I have to say in the last month and a half, I've never done so much walking uh, because we're, we, we have four possibilities. You can go out if you have to buy food. You can go out if you have to go to the doctor. You can go out if you perform essential service, but you can go out if you want to exercise. And so now I'm walking something like 10 to 15,000 steps a day when before I was lucky if I could do 5,000 or something. So, and part of that is because there are a lot of parks. It's not just walking through the parks, it's walking between parks in different neighborhoods and different directions. 
I think Melbourne has really three uh, sort of degrees of densification. Uh, you have the CBD in the downtown, which is quite dense, a lot of high rise. We're talking 30, 40, 60 story high rise apartment buildings. Uh, and then you have an inner uh, suburb, suburban ring, which is still quite dense, certainly by North American standards. These are really based more on European, certainly British models of terrace housing. Uh, and those are fairly easy within 15 to 30 minutes to walk into the central district and such. But then you also have Melbourne, which is a truly ex expanded, expansive suburban domain where it takes an hour and a half to drive in uh, from the suburbs. And this has been a real you know, point of contention and difficulty for the last uh, sort of 15 years. Uh, and our transportation systems, particularly the public transportation, have not really kept up with that. It's interesting, you know, I mean, another effect of, of the virus has been the degree to which pollution has been reduced because nobody's driving their cars and there's very little uh, industrial production in the same way. But it's also driven down the price of oil. And I'm afraid that once the restrictions are lifted, everybody will suddenly be driving a lot because the uh, price of petrol and, and gasoline is actually very cheap right now, though cheapest it's been in 25 years almost. So, you know, I, I would hope we could keep some of the benefits, particularly the environmental benefits that this has had. Uh, but, you know, Melbourne, for all of its uh, celebration as the world's most livable city, it also has some very, very bad uh, precedents that have extended for a long time in terms of a continual expansion away from the center, partly under the guise of affordability. Good. So, Don, uh, if you stay, maybe we can participate in yep. a conversation at the end. And now yep. I would like to invite to talk to uh, Mu Xiao Hui. Uh, Mu is my friend. He's the vice dean, uh, the deputy chief planner from uh, Urban Planning Design Institute of Shenzhen. Uh, I think uh, his company is called UPDIS. It's one of the best planning institutes in, in China, for sure. And uh, well, China was the place where it seemed that everything started. And I would like uh, that maybe he could share how was his experience. So how he live uh, these moments of uh, confirmation. <clears throat> I think that he's the, the, he's more a planet than not not an architect. So that means that maybe he can share his ideas about the community and the future of cities. So Mu, how are you? Okay, hello everyone. Yeah, so, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very okay. well. Yeah, uh, I can uh, show some pictures uh, from one month ago and. Uh, uh, recently, we can uh, I can explain to you what happened in China, especially uh, uh, like I live in Shenzhen. This city is uh, nearly uh, uh, 20 million people live here, similar like Wuhan. Uh, but I think all um, how to say uh, after nearly three months lockdown, I think uh, this month I think the epidemic is in China has been well controlled. Uh, there's only uh, 800 um, person uh, still in the hospital, only 800 in Wuhan. And uh, like in my city in Shenzhen, uh, mostly we're already back to normal life. But I can uh, share my some pictures to show what happened. So, uh, Can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, the mountains. Yes, we can see the screen. Yeah, I can see the picture. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, okay. This picture is uh, taken uh, from one month ago uh, after back to Shenzhen. Uh, you can see on the street, no more cars, almost empty. But normally, this is a, a main road in the whole city, it's really uh, it's crowded. Yeah, you can see it's 
almost the whole city is slept in sleep. Yeah, some uh, shopping mall almost shut down. Just taking this picture from my cars. This is taken uh, one month ago. And also in the Central Park, few people stayed. Yeah, this is a, a two dimensional uh, code. It's for everyone. Uh, this code is uh, everyone should have it. You should register it uh, on website. If you want to go somewhere, you can. You need to uh, show this, and uh, the government can show your this code to check where you have been, and whether you have been to some uh, how to say uh, affected area or space. This is my code. You can see uh, there's a green hat at the right corner. You can can you see that? Yes. Yeah, that means I'm I'm healthy. <laughs> uh, if if the, the the color of the hat is uh, yellow or red, that means it's bad. You know, you will be forbidden to go outside. And uh, this picture is uh, taken uh, yesterday. You can see uh, in the park, many people has uh, go outside to practice. Uh, the only different uh, compared with before is uh, everyone should uh, wear mask. Yeah, you can see some uh, commercial center. Yeah, uh, it's normally it's okay. Yes, you can see uh, some shop has uh, already opened and uh, to offer many uh, service for people. Yeah, this is the picture in uh, Shenzhen, okay. But this and, is, uh, I have to say, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. it's amazing to see such a blue sky in Shenzhen. I don't think I've ever seen the blue sky in Shenzhen. <laughs> Have you ever been to Shenzhen? <laughs> yeah, many, many times, many times. Many competitions, Mu, he does yeah. many competitions yeah. there, and also he's in the jury. Uh, maybe, I mean, uh, maybe I'm lucky, because I... <laughs> I stayed in Shenzhen for nearly uh, 20 years, and uh, mostly, uh, I think 80% of the days in one year, almost a blue sky. Yeah, maybe another reason is because uh, I wrote at that time. So few pollutions. <laughs> okay, uh, I want to talk about some of uh, my feeling about uh, the epidemic. I think there are two uh, out of the important things to support the life uh, in the cities for the citizens. One is uh, one one of the most important is uh, China has a, a highly developed electronic uh, uh, commer commercial, and the second is uh, we have a uh, how to say uh, we have divided into uh, many many of a community unit. Uh, the first thing is uh, because you can through some uh, the uh, electronic uh, commerce online, you can to buy anything and also you can to ask any help, any help from the government. Uh, so when the uh, city is locked down, we can stay at home, but uh, many of your, uh, how to say, uh, requirement can be solved on the website. That really gives some very important support for the uh, social operation. That's the most important things. And the second one is, uh, I think, because um, as uh, before, we normally, uh, for the social management, is uh, controlled by uh, city government. But this time, uh, we always, at the beginning, we, we uh, like to uh, divide into different city running for management. But this time, uh, that changed a lot. We have uh, divided into many uh, smaller units for the city. Uh, it's, it's good for, the manage, for management. And uh, uh, each unit, 
Sorry? Mu, I, I was thinking because you sent me a video and I can share here this. Can you stop sharing? Because I would like to share this drawing about the community because I really was very impressed. Can you stop okay. sharing? Yeah, this is perfect. Yeah. And now yeah. I will start to share because in order to illustrate your idea, you sent me this video where we can see uh, this idea of the communities, no? The idea that the city is closing communities and then you organize the city by communities. Can you explain this idea? Yeah, 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 okay. You know, uh, this unit is very small. It's holding a, how do you say, service for 1,000 people for each unit. And uh, each unit, they have uh, the government also uh, send some uh, officers and also include some volunteers to service for the people living in the unit. And uh, what happened in Wuhan, especially can be uh, a typical uh, a, a typical phenomenon. Uh, like example, we can, uh, the people living uh, in, the in their home, they cannot go outside. So they can give a call or make made order on the website and ask them volunteers and the officer to uh, help them to buy medicine, to buy food, or buy other things they need it. Yeah, you can see other people like uh, in Shenzhen, we are allowed uh, to, go, to go outside uh, one, uh, once for every two days. But in Wuhan, it's more seriously. So uh, from Wuhan, the appearance of the management is uh, to divide into many, many uh, smaller uh, city unit. That is uh, uh, what I think about. Maybe that will really affect uh, for the urban planning uh, in the future. Maybe we don't, especially in China, you know, we have a high density and a huge population. So after the epidemic, I just think about maybe in the future, we, uh, once we need to, uh, how to say, uh, reduce the density for the commercial, uh, for the community. And uh, the second one is for the management, for social management. I think we should maybe uh, learn from this time. We can to cut more smaller uh, city unit or people can, uh, how to say, uh, self-care and uh, so on. Good, so I think that is really very interesting, this topic of the scale that we have been discussing for a very long time, how, at which scale we do what, and then it's very interesting to see how in China you have developed the idea of the communities that are bigger than your house and your building, it's a bit like the block, and then there were some uh, co community managers that organized this idea of the, mo uh, the, the, the moment to go to buy and everything, yeah? Yeah. Good, so Mu, I, I would like to say hello to Seven. Thank you very much also for the support, Seven, thank you. And now we are moving to, we are inviting to talk to Anupama uh, Kundo. She's a great architect, one of the best Indian architects. Uh, she did several projects on on housing, so that means that she 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 did many beautiful buildings with bricks and the human scale. So that means that she had been working during a long time about housing. And uh, right now, I think that she is living in Berlin. But then I would like to ask uh, Anupama that she can share her thoughts about experience on living in Berlin, but maybe having some family in India why in India, we don't have news that there are many problems. It seems that in India, something media close is happening. So can you share us your thoughts about your experience? First of all, I would like to thank you, Vicente, to have, for having taken up contact with me again. And thank you, Arreti and uh, Javier. We would like to uh, you know, build on past relations. So I'm very happy to, on this occasion, interact with you all and get this global spectrum. So uh, I have to say that uh, since I have also lived a very globalized kind of life in the last few years, I when the COVID thing developed, 
I was, um, uh, I am a professor here in Berlin, but I have my office still in India. So in that sense, I'm very involved with the, what is going on in India, but I, I, in exactly this semester, I'm also a visiting professor at Yale University. So it was very interesting for me because I had all these tickets booked to go to America and I had the occasion to compare these three developments. Actually one, I have uh, seen three different uh, sort of uh, prototypical uh, manifestation of crisis, actually, no matter what the crisis is, uh, you know, it's a future crisis will also uh, play out in the same way. I think Germany for me was the example of a organized uh, good urban governance in place where there are socialist uh, um, or organizations, uh, you know, the, 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 the socialist values have led to a situation combined with urban governance where in fact we are not controlled by the police and all that because there is a responsible behavior even my children who are 12 and uh, eight years old you know they are freely they the children are feeling they know the rules nobody has to monitor you know that is the way the society is organized that it was i think easier for germany to uh, take the support of the individual and the existing collective um, mechanisms. Um, so I think here, for example, as a result, people are following their social distancing. People, there, there's no, there are, the police are not so seen, like say in Spain, what I have been seeing, you know, pictures where people know there are rules, but they want to sneak in and still go and do things. I mean, this is where my culture, you know, coming from India is a similar thing. The presence of the police it's like we we feel like when you wear a seat belt, we feel uh, that we are doing it to not be caught instead of thinking it's for our safety. You know, we have this mentality quite similar, I found, uh, in terms of how to control, uh, you know, we give the responsibility to someone else to take care of our uh, behavior somehow. Um, and within it, we want to live that duality, you know, of being irresponsible and free. So. I, I found that um, in in uh, in New York, for example, um, where I because I was halfway teaching, I also noticed uh, there again being a developed country, but being not socially set up, it all relies on in these moments. You see what it means when you have invested in the individual and a big imbalance with the collective. So. Coming down to the conclusion, I mean, to say some more about India, um, what I noticed is in, and this is a problem I'm fearing for India and India's urbanization since a long time, the problem of social segregation, when you see that everybody has not been taken along in the name of development, and there is a social disparity, which is extremely stark, you, you notice that it's always the, um, the people who are on the poorer end of the sectors, you know, they are the problem of the people who cannot afford is going to become a, such a big problem that even those who can afford will be infected, you know, or even in climate change or all the other crises that we are anticipating, we will have the same problem. So as a conclusion, I, I, I'm reflecting these days a lot on the uh, role of urban governance. And you see, I think, um, uh, since quite some time we know that cities like say Copenhagen or places which or even Melbourne how it's supposed to perform according to those criteria uh, I think when the governance is ahead we can expect to monitor and see improvements because we can uh, we don't have to deal with the anarchy I mean the individual and the collective are in sync they don't fight against each other and people don't complain a whole day about their governance and you know no matter which party comes uh, you know so th there is this aspect where in india you see that there is such a social disparity you know we are talking about stay at home but how many people have no home and how many of them are migrant labor so what th that is the biggest problem you see a lot of unrest a lot of huge problems because this, when a crisis comes in that moment, they won't be able to solve it quickly because we haven't worked on the larger system behind. And um, 
I don't want to take too long, but I uh, because I mean because of uh, your own uh, you know digital uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, engagement over the years, I'm always um, concerned that in order to use digital technologies to the fullest or for for steering a good um, um, future for humans. Um, regardless of which context, you know, we are all homo sapiens and what you have called it the body and the city. I think the collective needs and the individual needs are quite similar. We have separate contexts of where we are in the development. And, and I think where the digital technologies could lead to a good human future is I think if we focus on enhancing and amplifying the human potential and giving over, uh, I mean, not for us to become robotic ourselves, but to give away all those mechanical or, or all those things to the digital so that we can live a much more aware and present uh, uh, conscious collective life, you know? And I think there is a great potential, but in order for this to actually be useful like in India you know what do you do with digital technology when you can't even give electricity to everyone yet if you have not uh, how can we uh, when we are so behind in some sectors uh, in some for, for some people who can't afford if we don't see us all as one how will we take the higher technology so we will always call it low tech and high tech and that's the big problem of tech I think that when we are equal, or at least more or less equal, then we, we will see that there is the, it, we have to ask ourselves what is, what remains global, what remains local, and to bring everybody along to a certain common denominator so that we can use the practices like in China, you know, that people could be monitored. I think for the numbers and our population, India needs that. But we still have to work on, uh, on, on, on these barriers. On the other hand, we are a democracy. So there's some joy in that as well. Uh, uh, Anupama, tell me something, because uh, in your case and also the case of Melat, India is still growing and uh, under a process of urbanization. Do you think that this crisis that now in, in Europe, people say why we should live in dense cities if we can be doing work, teleworking, we can live anywhere in the countryside or something. Do you think this is going to affect to, to the idea of, for example, in China, that really most of the people move to the city? So the question is, do you think this is going to affect the way India or Africa is in the, uh, being developed? I'm a big, fa I'm a big, uh, uh, you know, proponent uh, proposer of uh, density because I think it, the the population on the planet, being what it is, especially India and China together, we are one third of the global population. We cannot afford to sprawl. I feel, and if our lifestyle, um, you know, now people are walking more. Even I lived in Australia, and I know that for some reason we used to not be walking so much, like we do in Spain. You know, like. Uh, so that all the lifestyle, it's not the number of people only, which is a problem, but the per person consumption of almost any resource has been very high, uh, what we call developed life, you know. And so if this combination remains how it is, then I feel we cannot afford to sprawl because then we will keep destroying our forests and our agricultural land. So in India, we do not, we have many mouths to feed, we need we should keep the impact of our infrastructure compact. And I think we can, I don't think Indians have a problem with that. They like, they don't need so much privacy. They, they like to be with other people. I think we have to look at the res human resources also as resources, but we have to balance the natural resource with the human resource because after all, we have to feed ourselves. Yeah. So thank you, Anupama. Now we would like to move to <clears throat> Addis Abeba. To we have Melat. Uh, Melat. Uh, we knew, knew Melat because Melat was awarded in another process. So when we started the Fab Academy ten years ago, we we had a process of selection. Uh, Spanish government helped uh, to people from 
uh, from uh, Latin America, from, uh, in fact, from Lima. Beno uh, Juarez is here, also connected. And also, Melad was selected in order to come to study to Barcelona. And then after that, to start to work and in doing some cooperative projects in, in Addis Abeba. Now she's working uh, for the World Bank and she's doing also very interesting projects related with housing. So, uh, Melat, hello, how are you? We would like to know how uh, you are living in, in, in Africa or in, in uh, Ethiopia, this experience. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vicente, for, for the opportunity to connect again with uh, IAC and the whole global community. Um, so I would like to say that uh, in Ethiopia, uh, well, after the first case was announced, uh, we, uh, there has been a few preventive measures early on, but uh, also the measures have been uh, very slow, but uh, continuous. So that created kind of a preparation for the people in general to accept and also understand the situation. However, there hasn't been a serious, uh, let's say, the European type of lockdown where you can't go out and that you can't uh, move around because uh, there are many people who live on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and uh, they will require to live off the markets or to live on uh, kiosks or to, to work, uh, let's say, in construction or in a service sector. So, so what, ha what is happening is that those who can afford to be home, they, are, they have been working from home and many, let's say, governmental offices are now really using the power of the internet where now meetings are, are being held uh, on the, on the, on, online. And this is helping everyone to mitigate these issues. Also, you see that um, there are small things you see, for example, uh, the, the church or mosques or worship places have been closed. And this is a big... Uh, this is a big step uh, that has been done. And uh, uh, in general, the country is very uh, religious and uh, people have accepted that and have uh, kept the social distancing even though things are still working. Uh, you see also that uh, the good advantage in Addis is that uh, there are small communities everywhere in the neighborhood. So I can go out in 10 minutes, I can buy my vegetable from the small kiosk. And also you see many houses have a little small water canister outside with a soap that you wash. So every bank has that. And what's also interesting is that uh, in general, we're, uh, we're, let's say in general, in relation to our country, to countries like Uganda or Kenya, uh, mobile banking or mobile use or uh, uses are not very, uh, uh, we're not very used to using these. But now that it's a necessity, even though the structure was there, now we use the banking system on our mobile phone to use to transfer money. And this is where also uh, I share Anne Pama's uh, thoughts about uh, technology, that it's clear that now we uh, need to invest in ICT and technology infrastructure for the whole country, because then we know that once we need it, we can use it. And this is one of the interesting things uh, about it. Uh, people have also been uh, very uh, proactive in, let's say, creating masks immediately. And, and you see that you have so many different types of nice patterned, uh, colorful masks all around the city. Also, you see many people uh, helping each other out and uh, let's say if uh, there is nobody who's uh, having a work now, there are many people who are creating communities so that they buy the essential needs, like let's say food, oil, and clothing so that they deliver to those people in need because there are many people who will, need, uh, who will be out of job now. But uh, in general, the, the numbers are, are quite uh, low in general in relation to the world right now. So, but we are uh, uh, getting there in, the, in terms of preparation. Also, when people come in, uh, it was introduced early on to have mandatory uh, stay in the hotel for 15 days. So this is the overall situation in Addis. Yeah. 
I, I, I would like that you talk maybe now about the project you have been you were doing and you mm -hmm. was awarded uh, awarded for that project because we have seen that Mu explained us that in Shenzhen they were dealing with this idea of the community and the convenience store and so on. But then in Africa, this is a bit different because the people mm -hmm. are uh, living and they are producing food, no? So this relation of the, your house, your orchard, the food, the market, all of this is very much connected. So how we can manage uh, these kind of communities in a moment when now we, is, uh, we, we promote some kind of social distancing? And how do you imagine that these communities will evolve in the future? Yes. So in uh, our project, uh, just to give you a background, was uh, we were always, uh, again, buying our food and vegetables from our small community markets, which are informal markets in every part of the city. They're called uh, gullits. And, uh, and where you go there, uh, you see that you buy fresh fruits and vegetables. But uh, for the sellers, uh, what's happening in general is that they lose their uh, produce uh, every day because they can't store it normally or uh, so they throw it away every day because if it's not sold, they don't have storage systems. And uh, the reason for that is one is that they do not, they may not have electricity or they may not have fridge, uh, they cannot afford a fridge to store their uh, produce. So with me and my uh, friends and teammates, we uh, had this idea of, uh, reappropriating traditional methods of uh, food storage systems uh, using clay-based material and using uh, natural cooling systems where the double clay will create a kind of a vacuum and then there will be uh, ventilation it will be ventilated towards the outside when the uh, air is too hot or it will just keep the the uh, the temperature as it is so uh, this idea we uh, rolled it out in the small markets in our community and also throughout the city in Addis. And uh, we used, we were communicating with the market vendors, those people who, who live um, most probably in a very, very low income every day. And it was very much accepted because it was uh, something that is possible to do. It is also based on an old cooling system. It was not a new idea, but the idea, but we were creating a technology where we can add on our uh, our new ideas into the old uh, system so that it can be more efficient and more better. And uh, we did it for one year and a half, and it was well received. And uh, we prototyped these uh, these storage systems in the small markets, and it was very well uh, received. And uh, yeah, it was a very interesting experiment. And just to add on, I think uh, this is also one of the things, like if we go back, I think there are many ideas in the world where we can really use energy efficiency and then use our new technologies and combine them so that we create a better, more efficient system for the, for the living systems or for habitats now, yeah. Great, Milat, again, a pleasure to talk with you. Now you. I would like uh, to move to Torino. I don't know if Carlo is connected. Carlo, are you somewhere? Okay, so Carlo told that that maybe he will connect a bit late. Maybe he was not able to connect. So then we are going to jump to Marcela. Uh, Marcela Sabino, uh, Marcela, are you there? Yes, yeah. yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you switch on your camera? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, thank you, Marcela. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to put my... Yeah, uh, she's in Rio de Janeiro. That is one of the... There are a few countries where we are listening always to scary things about this uh, crisis. One uh, of these countries is, uh, is uh, Brazil. Uh, uh, Marcela is the director of the, the lab director for the Museum of Tomorrow. So she's expert in, in, in some science that today is really under development is the so-called the foresight strategist. And then uh, if you are always looking to the future, 
we obviously it would be very interesting to listen to you, but maybe you could first share what is your experience uh, these days in, in Brazil? So um, our experience is, is very interesting because uh, much like the United States, we have a president who doesn't um, believe in the severity of this crisis. And even worse, he is trying to incite people to go outside and to, you know, to, to, to flout the, 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 the regulations of, you know, kind of no agglomeration and things like that. So it's been complicated. Um, and what's interesting in terms of uh, um, urban perspective is that uh, we have a lot of slums, particularly in Rio, called favelas. And um, you see that just because of the way that they're structured, um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the, the lack of urban planning uh, and all these kinds of things, it's very difficult to get things like ambulances or, 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 or regular supplies. Uh, there, so it's been interesting, and we've been seeing some really interesting examples of um, favelas, particularly one in São Paulo uh, called Paraisópolis, where they where they basically started. Um, they saw that they were going to get going to get help from the government, so they decided to do a massive organization. So you have there, they uh, rented an ambulance. They um, basically started having managers for the streets who would check uh, to see who needs food. Um, who's sick, who's not sick. So, I mean, I think once this crisis is over, we'll see amazing uh, bottom-up um, sources of innovation and creativity, particularly for the urban environment. So that's super interesting for us. Um, one other thing that we've been, uh, uh, you know, in terms of now what we do at the, at the museum lab, and, and now I'm, you know, uh, uh, overseeing the innovation in the museum, is this idea of, um, I think my colleague from Ethiopia mentioned mentioned this a little bit, but this idea of you know how do you how do you now think of new systems, right? What is this imagination? We're having a crisis of imagination here. Um, the system that we were in it, it, way back way back in the day in February 2020, which is like another era, um, you know. That system, you know, people are so worried uh, about what's happening now that they just want to go back to that system. But that's a system that doesn't exist anymore. We've already crossed the bridge and that bridge has fallen. So, so you know, I think that there, because of the fear that's involved in all this stuff, because it, it, it affects us um, in a very, in a very uh, a visceral way, this, this situation of fear of getting sick, a fear of not having food, of, you know, any kind of this existential threat, it means that it's, it, in terms of uh, mentally, we go to like the basest part of our brain, the oldest part of our brain, um, and we can't, and, 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 and we, we fall in the fight or flight or freeze mode. And so, and so I'm, I'm worried about this crisis of imagination that we might have here, which is the most important thing that we need to have at this moment. Um, and not just looking to the future, but what we've explored, experimented in the lab of the museum tomorrow is looking at the past. What kinds of you know, behaviors, evolutionary behaviors, um, have people developed from the past and what can we use from that to inform what future we might want. So for example, one quick example to finish off my, my talk is, is this idea of in, instead of thinking about in the industrial systems, right? So monocultures or, you know, these big like, you know, container, uh, you know, um, hydroponic systems, like why don't we think about ecosystems, how they used to think, you know, in, in the, you know, over a thousand years ago with the Mayas and the Aztecs, they used to have these huge aquaponic systems uh, where, they, where they created ecosystems and guided the ecosystems along. So if you do that, um, you, can, you can think of things in a very different way. Or for example, um, vernacular uh, architecture. So, so things like, you know, um, you know, constructing with bamboo and, 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 and using geodesic structures that have been used in, in certain countries in Africa or certain countries in Asia, you know, how can we adapt those to today? And so, and so we've been experimenting with this a lot. Um, to some people eating insects is something that is, comes very naturally to one fourth of the population. Um, whereas to Brazil, it, it is not, it is, it is not at all. So, so, you know, how can we, how can we rethink systems that have existed and then work well um, to, to do this kind of thing. So, so we worked with um, uh, some indigenous uh, uh, people this year as, as, as 
consultants on, on this kind of stuff. So, so I think it's I think it's really interesting to see that like explore you know what are these vernacular systems that exist uh, in in our in everybody's country you know what are these local based systems you know how can we use that but not ignore the technology so it's kind of this marriage of technology um, you know and 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 nature and all this kind of stuff so that's that's I think and uh, yeah so we were talking before about Addis Abeba and about or also India, where the people don't have exactly a, a home. In fact, here in Barcelona, we have this situation that the people say everyone need to go at home, but there are even homeless in the street. And then the government organized some big spaces for the homeless because they don't have a home. And then, but then the question is, I mean, we are going to be in this situation at least for maybe one more year. So how do you think we can tackle this situation? How do you feel the people living in favelas they are feeling? I heard that in favelas people are sometimes protecting themselves because they don't want, uh, so this is another kind of form of community similar to what Mu was saying about China. So favelas maybe can be closed because somehow they want to protect. So how is your feeling about this uh, living in favelas and how the people are protecting the community in this situation? So, I mean, that is such an important, and there's a distinction between homeless and favelas, right? Yeah, so, so um, I think that it's interesting because if you look at a city as a system, right? And we, we you know, one of, one of the earliest exhibitions we did at the, at the Museum of Tomorrow was um, Hacking Rio, you know? It was, it was, how do you think about hacking a city? If you see a city as a computer system, right? Like where is the excess capacity? Where can you optimize? Where can you, you know, uh, 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 look at the system view, um, we have so much spare capacity in systems. We have so much spare capacity in the world. We have so much spare mental capacity, which is what uh, Clay Shirky called cognitive surplus. So, so I think there's a problem here in, in organizing, you know, flows to these excess capacity. For, I'll give you a, a concrete example. So, so here in Rio, um, the city has had the great idea, actually, I don't always agree with the city, you know, in, in what they do, but they had the great idea of like opening a few hotels to uh, people in favelas who have very uh, close quarters, so they can't socially distance. Um, and they started opening these, these places um, for people to come and, and stay in these hotels for, for a certain amount of time to, you know, especially if they were sick or, or things like that. Um, but then there's also this kind of this, 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 so that idea in and of, it, of itself is really interesting because a city at any one time has so much excess capacity of space, of, of, you know, all these things. There's, there's tons of housing already. There should not be any homeless people because we have so much housing and you know, and and you have places like Utah that have done these projects of everybody has housing like what and it's about values it's about how you think about the world um, and they and they have seen based on you know what they look at you know in terms of how much it costs to um, you know attend a, a, a homeless person in an emergency or you know all these kinds of things versus buying them a house and all these indicators go up and so even in terms of, of, of cost, it's so much more cost effective to give housing. So, and we have a lot of, a, a lot of housing, you know, that could be in, in certain amounts of ways you can organize this kind of situation with the city or with, you know, sponsors or, or whatever the case may be. Um, favelas, mm -hmm. as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, sorry, just, just finishing. Uh, they, 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 uh, some of them have been organizing. Some of them um, have, chosen to, to go with the president. And so this mixed messages, because the president is saying this is just a small flu. The other day he said, 5,000 people died, so what? Like, what can I do? I'm not a, I'm not a savior here. This is a phrase that he said. So, so you have these different kinds of, um, of, of, of actions. But I mean, at I, I was as I was mentioning before, the self-organization is incredible. I think there will be a case for business students, you know, and for public policy students in the future for sure good so thank you very much uh marcela now we are back to europe uh to talk with carlo ratti uh carlo it seems that he's in europe but the background is like san francisco so maybe he you can where are you now carlo we cannot hear you 
actually I am in Boston. Sorry, it was um, let me let me show you actually the the, the background um, here. Uh, okay, here is um, is uh, Boston uh, right now. So I just want to share with you the, 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 the can you can you see it? Yeah, so you know yeah. we were following the sun, and then you were right. So you were after Rio. So this is this is great. As you know, uh, Carlo has his office in Torino, uh, Carlo Ratti Associati, but he's also director of the City Lab at MIT. He's receiving a phone call from someone. But okay, Carlo. So. Can you tell us what is your experience uh, during these days? We saw also that you you were one of the first architects starting to prototype something and to build something to answer uh, the topic in mm -hmm. your case, uh, something related with the hospitals and with the emergency rooms. Can you explain us this project? Yeah, I will. I will. And, uh, but let, let me say something of the inspiration for that was actually, um, you, you might recall the Rami Manuel. Rami Manuel was a former mayor of Chicago and also the right hand man for Barack Obama at the White House. And so Rami Manuel a few years ago, he said, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. So it's important a crisis is a time when everything changes around us and we need to start thinking about the new future, how we adapt to the crisis, how we respond. And that's really what design is about. You know, we often forget that design is always about the future. Design is about the future because you know, the very act of designing implies projecting into the future. If you design a piece of a city, if you design a building, you're thinking today about how that will look. Maybe in three, five, 10, 20, 30 years when you do an urban design project. And when you're doing it, it's also an act of, des an act of design is also an act of engaging with the future because it's about looking at um, you know, how life might be different then. So I think the important thing in this condition is really that we all think how we can use our skills to help you know, move to the next phase, to help adapt to the crisis, to reinvent ourselves. So we've been doing this exercise in the office and um, what you mentioned is the first project we did. It has been a nonprofit uh, open source project. And so basically one of the key things we will need in the next uh, six, 12, 18 months, you know, depends when we'll find a vaccine, we will certainly need more intensive care units, especially in the global south. And, and so we said, well, how can we do it? The way this has been done today takes a lot of time. You know, you need to convert a convention center into intensive care units. So it, it's, something, it's actually, the way people have done it, <clears throat> is, it works very well, but you know, has a number of limitations. And one of the key limitations is it takes time. You don't get biocontainment, so actually, you cannot contain the virus. The virus moves in the whole space. And um, also it's very difficult if you've got an intensive care unit in one city to move it to another city because you need to dismantle everything and mount it again. So our idea was can we use containers with negative pressure. Negative pressure means that you know, the air only goes inside the container so the virus cannot go out. This is the traditional way that hospitals do biocontainment. And so can we do a container with uh, this system, which is a traditional intensive care unit system for very high grade you know, ICUs in hospitals? Can we do this, put in a container, put all the medical equipment inside, put all the medical equipment inside and um, basically uh, do something that can be built, manufactured, pro uh, assembled, and then moved from one city to another city following the pandemic. So this is what we did. We developed the concept. We did it in open source. We put the drawings online. And the amazing thing is that uh, this has been replicated now. We started like six weeks ago. And, you know, there's people replicating the system all over the world, from Canada to the UK to Dubai to Pakistan. Uh, and so this has been really interesting. And for me, that's a, an idea that, you know, the, the way I would see it is that the virus is code and code replicates and is attacking us. And so what we can do as designers is produce, produce other code. That's the code of our ideas or our drawings of the things that, you know, we could design. And if you want to be quick, again, we need to replicate that code. Like, you know, with uh, Vicente, you've been one of the key people leading the Fab Lab movement in Spain. So, you know, that's the same principle. You open the drawings, allow people to clone it and to 
use the same code, the same drawings to produce locally, to modify them, produce. And so that's a way that we can use code in order to fight for the, against the code of uh, the virus, the DNA code of the virus. So it's a, some kind of a battle in how quickly we can replicate a piece of code. And if it can be faster than the DNA code of the virus that replicates and is infecting us. So that was just a, a quick thing about, you know, how we, we responded. Uh, and, um, but it's really great to see, you know, and thanks for bringing, bringing all of us together to really share ideas and uh, share experiences about how we all have been using design in order to reinvent ourselves to respond to the current pandemic. Good. And uh, do you have uh, any, uh, do you want to share a, a slide or? or? You no, know, I, I, I thought I wouldn't share them just for ease of simplicity, but if anybody's interested, um, you can just go to curapod.org. So C-U-R-A pod, P-O-D, all one word, dot org. If you go there, you find all the material. And by the way, and there's also different discussion groups on Reddit of people exchanging drawings. If anybody listen is interested in the project, you know, to take it and develop it further, to contribute to it. There's now a community in just a few weeks. We brought together a community of over a thousand people contributing to this in different ways. If anybody's interested, just go on curapods.org and you'll find all the links. You can download it, you can fabricate, you can help uh, develop it. Again, you know, I, I thought you know, it was easier not to, not to share it. It's easier for people just to click uh, on the website uh, to, to, to basically to go uh, on the website uh, with their browsers. You know, in uh, Barcelona, that there is this big uh, network of fab labs and makers. And in fact, when I was working in the city council, we create a public network of fab labs called Ateneos of Fabrication. And then the incredible thing is that during this crisis, the first first people that were able to answer uh, giving solutions about protecting the people uh, were the makers all over Spain. So I would say that the makers were acting in one day basis. Then there was the big companies like Seat and Fiat and others that they were printing kind of ventilators. It took like three weeks to one month to, to be ready to go. And then there was the central government that has been trying to bask millions of masks, but they fell already twice because once they brought the mask, they were wrong and they are giving back. So I would say that this is maybe the first time in the history where the makers has a very clear contribution to to the to the to the to the answers with a new form of industry. So the question yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. I think certainly the maker movement has been very quick. Now um, I think the maker movement has the process right, which is the process of the methodology. Again, the open source sharing, replicating is really the way to go. It's much faster. Companies don't do it because they just think about IP and protecting it. That's much slower in order to, to respond quickly to an emergency. At the same time, I need to tell you, I, I'm quite close to some, a lot of the makers who've been working on ventilators and so on. And unfortunately, somehow, you know, none of those ventilators have been used in the end because a ventilator really is quite sophisticated and needs a lot of electronics to adapt to the, to the breathing rhythm of the patient, needs a lot of sensors that, you know, you need to get specific sensors for that. Um, you need to be super careful about, you know, when you do something in the maker community, sometimes, you know, it's more like a prototype. If you do something where somebody's people is actually attached to such a machine, 3D printed machine, and if something fails, you know, you cannot tolerate that somebody dies. So I think what I want to say is that I think the lesson learned is, sorry, right? The lesson learned is exactly what you said, the center that, you know, the maker community has the methodology, right? At the same time, because it was so quick and it really got right. At the same time, if you look at the impact in terms of really doing ventilators and similar things, it was very small because almost none of those 3D printed ventilators have been used in real hospitals. And the reason is that, you know, again, there's an issue of reliability, as I was saying, there's a complexity, there's programming, there's a few things that, that are, you know, difficult to do in that context. So somehow what I see is taking the maker approach and the leveraging the maker community, but bridging it in this case, also with um, traditional fabricators with industry. And actually what we tried to do with Cura was exactly that because um, as, as I was saying, you know, we are sharing all the drawings online, but some of the people replicating this <clears throat> are both small maker communities 
but also big companies who can actually invest you know, really, if you want to build a Cura prototype, you need to invest a few hundred thousand dollars of medical equipment into in order to make it. And so some of them has been, you know, the combination of, you know, the maker approach and the bigger company. So I think what I want to say is that the maker community is amazing and has shown an amazing capacity to respond to the crisis. Uh, only the maker community also has limitations. And somehow what we need to do in the next few years is be able to apply this approach and extend it to broader sectors of society and of, and of fabrication. Yeah, I, think I completely agree. This is the idea of the digital reindustrialization of cities uh, that you was working uh, also many times. Uh, I think that this is another topic. So let's finish with the last speech because we look like British today, no? With a time frame, we are quite sharp on time. And then we have uh, Florencia Pita, She's in LA, she really wake up very early. Uh, 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 Florencia, she's an architect. I, I, uh, I'm in San Francisco, don't, see, don't you see? I also woke yeah. up very early. <laughs> Good. So Florencia, she's an architect, she has a company, her company as designer, and also she's teaching at SciArc. So Florencia, uh, my son was in LA, and really we were afraid about what's happening there, because we saw that some of their friends they decide to go to buy guns instead to buy masks. So I really was scared about how the Americans were reacting to that, but it seemed that the answer in California has been quite civilized. So can you share your experience there? Hi, Vicente. Th thanks for the invitation. Um, Arete, I saw you over there. Also, thank you guys um, for this global meeting. I started 6 a.m. Uh, LA time. It was night and now it's day. Um, but I thought also in China it's night, <laughs> we're like running through the globe. Um, so I've been looking at the chat, so since I'm the last one, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm not going to give a speech, maybe I'm, I'm just going to kind of close up on some, some comments. Um, and I think that to your point just now, Vicente, on regard to guns, um, you know, I'm also Argentinian, so, you know, so Marcela, you're in Brazil, you know, am I closer to that side as well? Um, and sadly to say, closer to Brazil also in terms of a ridiculous, um, you know, leadership that we have in this country, um, and that I'm not going to dwell on that uh, either. Um, I think that I wanted to follow up also on Donna's comment on regard to the individual and the collective in order to talk. I mean, I can talk about U.S., but I would like to talk about LA more specifically. Um, you know, it, and, and to the point of guns, Vicente, I think that has to do with individuals in terms of, you know, American culture, um, where the, the individual and the collective is always blur uh, with kind of, I would say, multiple feelings. And LA maybe is a city that it's more representative of those conflicts of culture. Um, I mean, you know, the numbers of LA are not like New York, but are quite high. I mean, are the highest in, in California, more than San Francisco. But Carlo, you're there, you can see. Um, so, so how a city that it's really uh, about, I would say about isolation, um, you know, because I would say this crawl makes for urban isolation. Um, you, you have a, a very different sense of community that you have in a European country uh, that you even have like in a city like New York. Um, so it's really hard to, to see how, um, how the city could change. I mean, I like to point out to, to what's next. I think that, um, uh, you know, so how, how you move forward, you know, to what's happening now. Um, LA, of course, the city shut down. I was proudly talking to my Argentinian family how people, a little bit like what uh, I think that um, um, Anupama was talking about Germany, how everybody follows clearly the orders of government. They don't need policing for that. I was proudly saying that to my family and then two days later, everybody went to the beach because they opened only two beaches and then that was the postcard of the city of LA. It's like People don't care. They just go to, uh, you know, public spaces. Um, they then you start to see photos of the police in the beach, you know, keeping people away. So, so it is. It's very conflicting. Like you feel a sense of, um, you know, community uh, on one point. That that's what I saw at the beginning, and then all of a sudden that sense of community is gone. Um, so, so, so 
So I think that you know, I think that all of, all of those all of those issues kind of are back and forth. The idea of um, neighborhood, the idea of uh, isolation in your home. You know, I would say LA is the perfect case for isolation because it is the city of the case study. Uh, it's like the city of the home, um, not only suburban home, but really the advancement of the home as the place that you are. And, and you know, you, even though we have a lot of neighborhoods, we don't have sidewalks. Well, most city, more areas of LA don't have sidewalks. Therefore, you have communities or neighborhoods, but you cannot walk through the communities. If, you know, there's neighborhoods that you are like, you know, really high end, you know, like Bel Air, um, you know, cities like Pasadena, you cannot even walk to the grocery because you have to walk on the street. You know, in the 30s, when there was a big city expansion, they preferred to give more space to cars, less space to people. So you have big homes, no sidewalks, big streets. So that, that, that issue of how a city of isolation, meaning that you're on your car, which you are isolated and you can drive here with no need for a permit, or you're inside of your home, hopefully you have a small garden or you have a, a space because you live in LA. So you have those kind of those two things. So where does the community fit in that, in that, in that, you know, uh, in that setting? Uh, and how you start to, you know, how you start to think uh, about the other, how you start to look at, you know, uh, social distancing from a place of isolation, which is your car or your home. So, you know, once, you know, public spaces start to open, then you start to see things like what happened you know, uh, last week um, when the summer started in LA. So, so I think that the idea of the individual and the, and the collective is a really important point, uh, not only for issues of, of, of you know, your, your civil rights, but also in how the city can change, you know. So again, like if you look at a new case study, so imagine for this competition that you have to start to think about the, the living space. Um, so if you were to think, what is the version of the case study housing 2020, you know, post COVID-19? So how would you, would you still think that the open plan is ideal model when you need your private space to chat on Zoom? Um, and then you have a, a you know, you, you have kind of, uh, you, you, the open plan does not work. Same thing as an office space. Um, let's say open plan model is still relevant when you need uh, privacy and silence. So, uh, because you have to chat now, I think that, you know, what, what things are going to change? So how, how, what is, what are the new rules that you have for that? Uh, you just go, I mean, my friends go in their garages <laughs> because that's a model of the office of, of the, you know, California, you know, future. So you should go into your garage. You have this, and, and that's, you know, that's the office of the future. So I, don't, so I like to think that what, what is case study, um, you know, 2020 in a city for LA? And also the case study model was a model was quite revolutionary that expanded the notions of what is design thinking in the city of LA and how imagination was kind of so relevant in a kind of post-war environment. And all of the, I, I think, um, um, I'm just trying to follow up on everybody's name and Carlos point or Ram Emmanuel, you know, don't let it, um, don't let it, uh, a crisis go to waste. Um, and I think that Donald uh, talk about the, the, you know, the Spanish flu sadly said Spanish is, is you know, again, giving a name of a country to a flu uh, a pandemic is quite uh, the wrong way to go, but the flu of the twenties, you can call it. Um, was what what did it change you know it really affected the city of new york in certain ways but i'm not sure that it, it did major um urban change itself so you know let's not let this this crisis go to waste and really you know use this great floor florencia thank you uh you know it was called the spanish flu because at that moment was the only country that has the free uh, uh press freedom for the press because all the global, all the countries were in war, and then there was not information. Only newspapers that were talking about the flu were the Spanish, and that's why it was like called like that. But but yeah, part of the uh, Bauhaus and some new engineers for the 20th century was also connected with the situation 
that, uh, that yeah, many people, really many people around the world was dying because of this situation. I would like, uh, so this has been incredible. Everyone was talking, this is great. And now we have uh, still like 10, 15 minutes to talk. I would like to invite Tomas Diev. Tomas is also director of the Fab Lab Barcelona and, co and director of the Master for uh, Design for Emerging Futures at IAC. Tomas, you are, where are you? I am in Bali, Indonesia. Oh, uh, this is the bad place to spend uh, <laughs> lockdown, yeah. It was a coincidence, believe it or not, it was a coincidence. Then it was not a coincidence to extend somehow try to spend the, the lockdown here. But it's interesting because in the, uh, Bali is a, it's a place where until January uh, was receiving three flights from, from Wuhan per week. And uh, we haven't had any, any news of uh, crematoriums being collapsed or the hospitals. And I, uh, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, I don't know if they, you know, the bodies are feeding the sharks or if we are really in a kind of a sanctuary where for some reasons for what people drink, like the jam, which is a very special drink, the corona is not affecting. But yeah. Uh, this is a question, a comment or a reflection? Uh, because it's it was, true. It's, uh, it's a bit, a bit of every. The... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Go ahead, go ahead. It's a bit of everything. Uh, the truth <laughs> is that obviously, in general, it's very difficult to get some images from uh, from China. We saw many of these images on uh, common burials in uh, New York, but also in Brazil and in some other places. Uh, someone said that the numbers will know the numbers in general after the crisis because during the crisis we are like in the middle of the battle and that information sometimes can be contradictory and can be used by the enemy no uh, but anyhow i will thank you Tomas, for your contribution um yeah i would like to use this last 10 minutes for some kind of uh, final comment i don't know beno you are in in, in lima do you want to make any comment uh, Donald, you are you were the first to talk. I don't know if you have any comment. Hello, Super Vicente. Thank you so much for this invitation and thank you everybody uh, to join this meeting and share your experience. Uh, amazing experience. I am really, really inspired for all, uh, all these histories and what are we living and this changing in the life. Um, well, here in Peru and in Latin America, we are working together with different labs, integrating efforts, Integrating process with this concept and idea original from Fab City, you know, the distributed uh, fabrication, sharing information, and distributed fabrication. <clears throat> and this is really working faster than governments and traditional companies. So thank you so much for this invitation and see you, see you soon. Areti, any comment? Um, yeah, I have a couple of comments that I was thinking while I was. Uh, yeah listening all the different experiences from all over the world and um, there has been a lot of discussion of uh, you know like how are we going to work or live um, uh, in cities and, and buildings especially about the working in the offices and um, something that Donald was saying in the beginning is uh, the fact that um, maybe this will not affect it as much because uh, the Spanish flu didn't affect it either, no? But I believe that uh, we are somehow um, mistaken in, in certain points of view when it comes to the pandemic. And, and the first one is that we consider that it is now more than ever that we need to think our interior spaces while 90% uh, of our time we're spending it into interior spaces. So it's not now that we, that we need to, to rethink about it. Of course, it's more focused now into housing, but in general, um, um, I think it is, um, uh, it is becoming very critical uh, to think how we spend our time indoors. What is the quality of the space indoors, both in office and in housing? And if we take into consideration that um, there are 7 million of people that they die annually uh, because of uh, indoor and outdoor contamination, I think that this is another topic that we need to take into consideration when we are talking about um, uh, giving a response or, or, or a design for living, let's say, idea for the future, no? Um, is, um, 
it is uh, there is of course no no uh, again a clear um, connection between uh, climate change and 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 an epidemic or a pandemic but of course the fact that uh, uh, you know, like uh, animals are, are moving closer to the urban environments because we are deforestating their habitats. Uh, it is definitely something that brings closer to humans viruses. So I think that we need to, uh, within this reflection of how we are um, rethinking the way we live, uh, rethinking the way we work, I think uh, we need to, to more than ever have a global response into everything related to climate change. I see that there are a lot of initiatives <clears throat> around different cities uh, in Europe and the world to um, maintain, let's say, uh, contamination levels uh, really, really low. Uh, some of uh, people have been uh, amazed by the image of Sensen and the blue sky of Sensen, but this happens in too many cities. Uh, and um, I believe that this uh, has been an opportunity to really put on the center or on the epicenter of the discussion issues that um, have not just uh, emerged now with uh, uh, the pandemic, but has been there for um, um, the last couple of decades. And we need to, to be much more responsive now with our design solutions and our design ideas, because what we are experiencing is uh, more than a health crisis, is a design crisis and therefore as Carlos said as well, we need to take this as an opportunity to give solutions through design. Thank you, Areti. Uh, Don has shared some thoughts. I don't know if you would like to share with your words or you are so tired because it's so late that... Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm, I'm listening in. I think it's a very uh, stimulating conversation and it's great to hear from other places. It's just after midnight, so it's not so late here. Um, look, no, I just, I, the, the comment, the last comment I had just had to, it is something that I'm hopeful for that comes out of this, uh, that, you know, that people have begun to understand. It's quite clear. I mean, it's very evidence-based. You can see those places who have followed the advice of experts have emerged from the crisis sooner than those who haven't. Uh, you know, whether it's New Zealand or now with Australia, uh, you know, uh, Korea, for instance, and so on and so forth. And, and that also have practiced some sort of collective uh, intelligence of working together, knowing that, you know, with freedom also comes a certain responsibility and that sometimes you have to hand over some of those actions uh, in order for the greater whole, you know, both for the current, but also for the future. So, you know, there's some very positive social consequences to this. I mean, I'm less, I'm less inclined to think that there are specific design uh, solutions, although certainly the, I think, as you mentioned, you know, the whole fab lab process of building visors and uh, various uh, uh, material for prevention and for safety for, for the medical staff is, is really fantastic and it's happened pretty much everywhere. But I think the more profound one from my point of view is a change of attitude that we could actually go back to not listening to the demagogues and the politicians, but actually listen to some experts because we can show that it has saved lives and it has changed uh, you know, cities for the better. Uh, in terms of not prolonging a really difficult situation. So that's my aspiration. Thank you very much. Mu, do you have any last comment from Shenzhen? Yes. Uh, I think it's really hard to answer how to change our behavior. Uh, but after all, don't eat wild animals. That's really correct. But I think uh, we should uh, pay more attention uh, about how to define and uh, divide uh, community unit because that will promote the efficiency of the social operation. And uh, the last one is I think uh, unity and uh, the kindness is the most important fundamental, that's all. Good. Uh, any last comment from any of the speakers? Marcela. Um, hi, Vicente. I would only say um, 
imagine ourselves out of this crisis uh, and that we need to, um, what the, the world that we want doesn't exist. So how can we imagine it together? And I think it's so amazing to have so many awesome people here uh, to do this because the future is not a destination. It is a process and it's something that we create through our decisions, our actions, and where we put our energy. So that's what I have to say. Great. Uh, I would like to add on, uh, on something maybe uh, for me also, it's, it's more important that we understand what is really important to us in our lives now. And I think uh, being very close to nature is very important and that we can combine our, our, our achievements as human beings and, and combine whatever we have as nature and technology as one of the big points to live our life in the future. And I think that's very important to consider. Good. Florencia, any last comment? Um, I mean, I think it was, it was great conversation. Um, uh, one thing I just wanted to say is, um, I think that after this crisis, people will realize how relevant the public space is for everybody. Uh, because the first thing that you see is that, you know, I think it must uh, show some pictures of people walking um, on a park or walking somewhere, going to a, a plaza, uh, going to a restaurant. So, I mean, missing a public space um i would say it will empower public space you know even the small corner uh the little park you know everything will be will have i think more value now good so thank you to all the speakers i would like to say also thank you to laia pifarre that is over there she helped to coordinate everything michael salka she's the coordinator for the by Daura Labs and the Master for Advanced Ecological Buildings and Biocities, and also Gabriel Fredericks that was helping on the diffusion of the event. You know that this uh, competition uh, will be open during two months and a half. I would like that those that are professors and have some educational role, uh, if you could promote this, um, this competition, among your, your students, it will be great. Um, in the next two months, we'll do in some events. With Willie Muller, we are going to organize one about uh, inviting some good friends like Hernán Díaz Alonso, Julio Gaeta, and some other Latin friends. With Tomás, uh, we'll organize next week uh, an event more related with the makers. Uh, but uh, on, uh, at some point, middle May, we'll organize, we'll invite three of the winners of the competition. Uh, one of the last winners of the competitions is Javier Fernandez. He is from Nicaragua. He was studying in Mexico and then he got the award. He came to study to Barcelona, to IAC. And then while being a student, he applied for a competition to build a sport hall and he won. So the incredible story of Javier is that he last he built that sport hall. Last year he was awarded uh, like the best sport hall in the World Architecture Festival, and he got the Premio Ciudad de Barcelona or architecture that I didn't win yet. I hope I will at some point. But that means that this competition <laughs> makes some people happy. We learn a lot. We publish the results of, uh, of the finalist people. And for us, this is a good way to, to develop a, a kind of international debate about the future of design and the future of how we live. So thank you very much to, yeah, Thomas say it's only designers and makers, not only makers. Yes, I agree. We'll have the debate with designers and makers. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. And yeah, in some days we'll launch another call for uh, one discussion. I would like to ask you one last thing, please. Can you, all of you, switch on your camera? Because I like to see the faces of the people. I see Hasna, I see Galina, Israel, Tulio, Ariel, uh, more Galina, Ari Ariana. Yeah, I like to see the faces of the people. Ira, Madeleine, Juan Camilo, Mayra, Laura. It's great that we see, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I am so happy to see all of you. You know that we are, uh, we have speakers. Laura Marsilio, this is great. 
uh, we have Key SM, uh, Mayra, Juan Camilo, Tina, uh, Susaniti, Madeleine, so Guto, Mayra. So yeah, thank you all of you for being here. Uh, at IAC, we are very proud to be a global community. We have like 200 students from 60 countries every year. Uh, IAC is resisting, we are online, but also we are somehow having uh, labs will be will reopen very soon. And basically we want to change the world. We always wanted to change the world. We are contributing on changing the world. And uh, yeah, we hope that with the collaboration and this open discussion, we'll be able really to become influencers. Uh, Carlos said very clear, it's not enough to print something small. This is the first step, but our goal really need to be to change the world, to make that the makers, the designers are the next leaders of the future, as Donald say, that the science people and societies follow science. So Jordi, Michael, Scott, Andreas, uh, yeah, now uh, I see many people. Thank you all of you to be here. And okay, we switch off and see you next week. Thank you. Bye.